Well, this video is a little overdue. The Canon R7. So, about that autofocus. Yeah, this video is long overdue. I meant to have this video out a long time ago, probably at the one year mark. We're just almost the one and a half year mark that I've had this camera. I was really lucky in my area to get all this camera right when it came out. And like I said, I've had it about a year and a half. And in that time, I put it through some torture. It's been in downpours, a lot of rain for several hours without a rain cover. I've had it in sand and pumice out in Katmai, the nastiest stuff. I've had it in mud. I have dropped it. It, it has been through some rough environmental conditions. And I've also put it in some of the toughest conditions to shoot, to get the focus, to get the image, to get the video. I've really done it. We've done a ton of videos. You can go through the channel and you can find all kinds of R7 videos where either I'm shooting it or my uncle was shooting it this summer when he had the RF 100-400 lens. And that is a great combo. Uh, leave me comments in there if you want me to do another video about that, uh, expressly just this combo with the RF 100-400 with the R7, and I'll, I'll do that video. Um, I love that little combo. Uh, it, it's great, and Don is just loving it right now. So what are we gonna accomplish in this video? What are we gonna talk about? We're, we're gonna go out and, and do a little bit of shooting. We're gonna talk about different aspects of the camera. And towards the end of the video, we're gonna talk about the pros and cons of this camera. And what I feel like the pros of this camera are and the cons of it, so what's, what's gonna be good about it and what are the drawbacks of it. And at the end I'll talk about is it, do I still think it's a great wildlife camera for intermediate, even some pros, and down to the beginner to what I think of that camera. And is it a great buy still in 2023 going to 2024? So with all that said, let's go get out in the field and let's go see what we can find today. So yeah, that worked really, really well. The eye tracked really well. What you'll notice with this R7 is if you have good contrast, which means you can see the difference in the colors around the eye, or you can see the distinctness of the eyes of the viewfinder, it'll grab the eye. If I got the uh, exposure too low, not as much contrast, it would find the head, but not the eye. If I raise the exposure a little bit, it'll lock the eye. So. The trick with the R7 and all your mirrorless cameras or auto detect or focus systems is if you've got a subject like this that's not moving a lot, what you want to do is raise your exposure a little bit, bring that ISO up a little bit, get the lock on the eye. Since the moose is not moving, you've got your focal plane, you're on the head, you're on the eye. Drop your exposure. I mean, this is just in a second. Up, lock, back, let off, back down to the exposure you want take your picture. And that'll give you the eye focus, the focal plane and everything. I don't have the Atomos on right now uh, because it's, I didn't know what I was gonna see back here, so I didn't bring it with me. 
but it was locking that eye. It was locking the head when it couldn't find the eye. It was finding it every time, even in video through the grass. So this camera is fantastic in video. I speed it at 1080p, 120 frames a second, because that's the fastest I can get for the motion. Get this buttery slow-mo. And even when the, the moose put its head down behind the grass, it was still tracking the eye. So just fantastic and beautiful footage. So I'm going to let this guy go about his business. Uh, got a couple okay pictures. I'm not really looking for any bangers today. I'm just out using the R7. Talking about the R7, what it does good, what it does bad. So let's we'll see what else we can find. Oh, this is really cool this morning. And it is chilly out of here. It's been in the high teens the last several days. We got a lot of hoar frost out here on the ground. Almost looks like snow, but it's just frost. And uh, right now it's just barely 20 degrees, so it's a little nipply. Um, but what I've got right here right now, what I'm talking about is on this the right side of the trail, I've got a moose right here, a bull moose bedded down. Um, until I came around the corner, I really couldn't even see him. He blends in so well in this grass and stuff. And just like always, the moose, when they bed down, it never fails for me. They've got clumps of brush right in their face, and I can't really get a good clean shot of him. Now, with the R7, though, if he lifts his head a little bit with the eye gets behind that brush, or I can, the camera can see the eye, it's jumping to that eye, which is really good. Because what I talked about earlier was about the uh, eye detection where to play with that calf. Um, I wanted to see how that eye detection works. Of course, I don't have the Atomos on here right now. I'm running pretty light right now. Uh, and plus, I can't see through the viewfinder and the LCD. I have to look through the monitor. Um, this better down moose right now wouldn't matter. He's not moving a lot, but it's easy for me to get my eye up to the viewfinder and see what I'm doing. So I'm not recording the Atomos right now. Later, I will just show you the autofocus. But as soon as that moose lifts his head above that brush, it's grabbing that eye every time. So it's really cool. They added the, um, like I talked earlier, they added the horses into the autofocus on the R7 and the R5 and all those. And that's really helped with moose and elk and things like that. So it's really good that it's finding that eye. And one thing you want to do with the eye detection on all subjects, what's not grabbing the eye, you probably don't have enough contrast in your image. So raise your ISO briefly, get your lock, especially if like this, the animal's not moving. So what you want to do is raise that ISO to get that contrast, hit your autofocus, get the eye lock, get your finger back off the autofocus button that's prime, and then bring your ISO back down to the exposure that you want to have. The reason why you take your finger off, because if you raise that low, lower that ISO back down, then the autofocus may jump somewhere else to the head or get off that eye. So by getting your finger off the button if your subject's not moving within your focal plane you're golden but that's the trick to get focus i learned that back with the r5 it's translated with the r7 the r8 all the canon cameras even the nikon cameras raise the iso to get the contrast get your lock bring your iso back down or your exposure back down where you want it but uh, we're going to go see if we can get some better angles on this guy i don't know when he's going to get up he should have been up eating but he decided to lay down but we'll see what we can get i'll talk to you just in a minute Pretty cool. Moving on.
I'm gonna just treat your life to keep that <laughs> camera steady so I can get some video. Shoulder's a little sore today. It's kind of hard to hold this lens up right now. So, very cool. Um, light's really not bouncing on quite a bit through these trees. So we're probably gonna hang with him for a bit, see if he gets up and moves a little bit, but. So as far as the autofocus right now for this moose, it's working really good. Now, I've got like four different layers of grass between me and him, close to me, immediate, and there's some right in his face and some just a little bit off of his face. So hitting the autofocus is gonna grab all that grass close to his face, just will, because his eyes hidden behind that grass. So the trick to do, like always, I've talked about this many times, hit that single point to get it to that eye or to the head or close to the eye and then quickly hit the autofocus button to grab the eye and get off it real quick because this guy's just sitting. Why is that? If I kept holding that autofocus button down, it's going to eventually, it's going to eye, 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 then it's going to hit that grass and it's going to jump to that grass and stick. So that's just any autofocus system is going to do that because his grass is way too close to his face and his eyes behind that grass. So single point, get it to that moose, touch that eye real quick just to get the lock you know if it jumps back to the grass when you hit it then single point again keep doing it until you finally get the eye lock and get your finger off the button and then take your picture so that's what i'm doing here with the video it's a little trickier i had to go up higher to get the get that focal plane lock on him and then kind of come down to that grass and shoot until it finally the autofocus finally gave up and touched some grass and then it, it's off so Kind of what it is the autofocus really really good it's still one of the better autofocus systems i've had for shooting animals for video and for uh stills so far is that autofocus system on this canon just incredible incredible so we're gonna see what this guy does for a little bit if not we'll move on and we'll talk about some other stuff and we'll get into that autofocus of how it focuses how it works and why people are discussing a lot about is the autofocus good or bad and the things that people have got from Canon about what you should be shooting. So we'll talk about why that is, what causes that and how to counteract it. So talk to you here in just a bit as we move on. Well, this is as good as any place to talk about this autofocus system on this Canon R7. So I got this bull, like I said, just bedded down here to my left so I can kind of keep an eye on him and I've got enough trees behind me in case he decides to, if he gets up, I'll hear him, I'll be able to get up before he does, but a little bit of safety too. So try not to get my head over here because I put my head over here. <laughs> the sun's hit me real hard. But anyway, the autofocus on the Canon R7. So you probably all watch the tons of videos from many people talk and read many articles about the autofocus when you hit the eye in your sequence of images you see images that are not in focus and it does happen it happens with every camera it happens the dslrs it happens with every mirrorless manufacturer canon nikon sony micro four thirds cameras on down the line because the focus system if a bird is or something's moving it's trying to, you got three things going on, and gotta remember this with a camera. You've got your sensor, which is a sensor readout speed. How fast does that sensor read? That's your eyeballs, what it sees. Then you have your processor, your algorithm. And that's your Digic X and these cameras, X Speed 7 and then icons and so on. That is your brain to interpret the image, what it sees to determine, oh, that's a moose. Oh, that's a bird, that type of thing. The next thing you have is got, it has to transfer once it says, oh, that's a bird. So it's got to do that thinking from what the image is seeing from the sensor. Again, that sensor, how fast is it reading to send that information back and forth as it reads to that processor. It's got a process that, okay, bird, animal, whatever. Then it starts going through this little algorithm. This is all on the flying fast, but then it says, okay, there's the head, body, eye, what I expect to see, where I expect to see the eye. That should be an eye. So now all that's happening. The next step, the important step that a lot of people forget, it has this camera body has to send that signal to the lens. 
and then it has to tell these motors in this lens to turn to get to that focus plane to hit that spot that that autofocus is seeing. So all those things are going on. And like I talked in the, I don't know if you, you probably didn't watch it because you're watching R7 videos, but in the Z8 setup menu, I talked about the one mistake I see tons of people making is thinking that autofocus subject tech button is a magic button. It is not a magic button. If you hold it down, it's magic because it actually find the eye. That algorithm and that machine learning is fantastic to find that eye or find the animal amongst the scene. But it's not a magic button to hold down all the time if you go in because it's constantly looking sensor, processor, lens motor, constantly saying, okay, here's a subject. So just like this moose over here, I've got grass really close in front of his face. So what happens is it's got the eye, got the eye from holding that autofocus down the whole time. It's going eye, 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 and it's evaluating over and over. As long as you hold that button, it's evaluating where is an eye, where is a what, what subject is seeing, what type it is, and where should the eye and the head be. It's doing that over and over and over. And if it gets confused or lost, or it says, I don't see an eye, or I don't see a moose anymore, but I do see this stuff in front, it'll grab maybe the grass in front, or like with the woodpecker, I had woodpeckers where they're in the hole when they had babies, but there was a knot right above their head and it would get confused between the woodpecker's eye and the knot. It would go back and forth and jump back and forth. If it did that, the focal plane was behind it. So what's happening is, is when it's moving around, let's say it's a fox. So a fox is really bad, a red fox, with cameras detecting the eye or the ear as what the eye is. So with the R5 and it first had it, it would jump to the ear a lot more than it would go to the eyes, especially unless you really cranked up that ISO to get real high, con you know, bigger contrast in that image. So that was what was happening there. And then over firmware times, it stopped doing that. It was jumping better to the eye, but sometimes it jumps to the ear. So what's going on there, as it goes from the eye to the ear, you're going through all that stuff. It says, it says now this spot, this focal plane back here by the ear instead of the nose, or the eye, excuse me, <laughs> is the focal plane so it tells the processor everything tells the motor hey focus back here for a second and then it may jump back to the eye so it comes back again and with the r7 like people say and hey I'm, I'm my whole sequence i'm seeing lost focus and this is what's happening that focus will jump maybe to the tail the body or something like that because you'll see a lot of times birds it'll go eye body eye body it'll go big box little box big box little box over and over but that's causing that focal plane to shift a little bit. Sometimes just enough to make things get out of focus. And with the R5, people say, I don't see the, on the R5, I don't see this happening. Well, here's the biggest reason why. It's because the sensor readout speed. So the sensor readout speed on this is 31 milliseconds. The sensor readout speed on the R5 is 50 milliseconds, twice as fast. And the second part is, with the R5, you're shooting either 12 frames a second in first curtain or mechanical, or 20 frames in full electronic. This one, most of the time, we're shooting 30 frames a second. So you got more shots happening. So with that sensor readout speed being slower, it takes longer for this camera, the motor, to correct itself or start spinning, or maybe it'll start spinning and it'll say, no, go somewhere else and it'll change again. So this motor is in between during all those shots because they're so fast in there. As that motor's moving, you lose focus. You don't have that critical focus on the spot you wanted to have it on. The R5 does it too, but it, since it's faster, you don't see it as much. It's quicker to say that 15 milliseconds more of time to send to the processor, and the processor to send it to the motor is much quicker and you're shooting less frames. So the suggestion for Canon was to shoot this thing in 15 frames a second, which gets you closer to that R5, remember, at the 12 to 20 frames, kind of in that middle. But your sensor speed's still, still lower, so you're still gonna see some of those spots in between if you're holding the autofocus button down the entire time. And that's what I kind of preach a lot. I learned this a long time ago with the R5, especially that Fox. When I got that lock on the eye, that Fox is not moving out of the focal plane I have set if I've got an F8, I've got, it, I've got the whole nose in front of the nose, back behind the ear, or the middle of the body in focus. I know once I get him locked and he doesn't kind of move out of that little one to two foot range, I'm gonna get that eye. Eye is gonna be focused, face is gonna be in focus. So what I did was I'd get that eye lock, get my finger off that button. Once I had the eye lock, get off, just like the DSLRs. We didn't hold that down the whole time. We got the lock, we quit. If the fox moved forward, move back, I'd tap it again to get that lock. And then sometimes, 
Now, if you've got a subject in motion, yes, you have to hold that button down. You hope to God it stays on the eye or the body, the focal. You get a big enough depth of field. So that's what's happening with this camera. The sensor speed is slow enough that when it sends that signal process through to that processor, to the motor, you're getting that delay. And it may say ear this time, and it goes to the ear. But at the same time, it's going closer to that ear. The focus goes back the eye says no I'll go to the focus so this thing is kind of like the old uh cartoon shooting the little decoy going between he's not getting to the end he's going in the middle back and forth that's what's happening with that motor so it may sit right there in the middle sometimes i had that happen to me in seward and it ruined a whole set of pictures that was two things going on that was going on and the second thing we we're talking about with the autofocus here in a second about this guy with with contrast conditions and almost all my images were just not in focus anywhere they were close but they weren't close enough they were just a little bit soft almost like i had a mist filter on the camera and really didn't get the shots so really bit because i had these long legs and sandpipers sitting in super just really wet mud so i had the reflections of the bird both ways just perfect i got some good shots but i lost a lot of shots too the first thing with this a little bit of hunt and the second thing that it was was the contrast now we'll talk about that too so the other thing with this camera is, and within this we'll go through the pros and cons of all this camera, and these will be part of some of the pros and cons, is this thing in decent to good light, fantastic on autofocus and image quality. When you get to crappy light, low contrast situations, that's where this, the focus will go in between. It already has that problem with sitting that signal if you're holding that button down the whole time it's going to keep processing it's going to mess up that where it's going to focus on that spot hope these planes aren't too loud behind me i'm behind the airport and there's a lot of little planes taking off they're noisy so in those low light situations it will struggle sometimes to find that head or body or eye and again once you do just like we talked about here raise your exposure up and that's the second thing that i messed up when it's sewer with those shorebirds and that reflective uh, mud there was i was keeping my exposure where i wanted it not where i needed it to get the lock on the focus so if i would have raised my iso got the locks then dropped it back down to get my shot or just shot it overexposed and brought it back in post i would have had more shots that actually hit where i wanted them to hit so and these low contrast situations, which kind of this is right back here, this is real shadowy stuff. That focus is gonna have problems at times finding part of your subject. So like shoot this grass, is another problem I have right now when I was trying to shoot it while I was watching the video. Since there's not a ton of light right now, because the sun's just now coming across the top of these mountains out here, it has a little harder time finding it. So what you do is you bump that ISO up or whatever you want to do with your exposure triangle, lock your shutter, drop your aperture, whatever you need to do to get that better exposure. And then it will you'll notice what will happen, it'll lock on. So what do you do, and what are my suggestions on how to use this camera? How do you use this in the field to get the best autofocus out of it? So like all my other cameras I talk about, it's the same method on all the other ones, on, on the Sony and the Canon and the Nikon, do it the same way. Because they all have the same struggles with the autofocus. And that is when you first see a subject to burn a tree or something, like I had a nut hatch uh, yesterday I ran into. So this nut hatch is up here a little higher up in the tree above me. And it's got another tree behind it that's got a lot of pine cones. So I've got some gold light, it looks really good. So I'm trying to get that gold light rather than clear sky. Because I have clear sky, autofocus jumps it every time. And I know this in my head, but I know I'm going to get it with a busier spot. So the very first thing I do is I hit that single point to jump to the branch or the bird, whichever I'm trying to hit right there in that center. I'm putting it on the bird and I hit the single point. What that does, that instead of this thing having to focus this long range for me out to wherever this focus is sitting and this bird sitting, is now I've done, so I've reduced that amount of area that that camera's got to look through because the focus plane now is closer to that bird instead of being farther away from the bird. Because if you look at the viewfinder, it's all blurry. It's got to figure it, it's got more to look at to figure it out. But if you put it closer to that plane of field, it's going to jump to it. The Nikon, Sony, and Canons all will jump a lot faster to that subject. And once you do that, once you hit that autofocus, so here's the thing. My focus plane on that nut hatch was a you know a few inches and the nut hatch is a couple inches 
and I'm not moving and the bird's not moving out of those couple inches. He's just eating seeds out of that little pine cone right there. So I know he's not moving. So once I get the focus lock on that bird, I know he's completely in focus because my focal plane that I'm shooting at F4 was large enough to cover more than the bird, right? So I hit the autofocus, subject detect, hits the bird. I got my finger off the autofocus. As long as I'm not moving like this, which we all do sometimes, and I hit that shutter, I'm gonna have an in focus bird through that whole burst. As long as I'm not moving, as long as that bird doesn't move out of the focal plane, times you want to hold it down longer is that that bird's hopping forward or backwards on the branch which he wasn't doing so i didn't have to do it so let's say that nut hatch is sitting there he's eating i had my focus i've got my finger off the focus button i'm just taking pictures with the shutter and he moves forward a few inches all i do then is i just tap the focus button again it gets locked and get my finger back off of it as long as he's staying right there take my pictures so every time he moves i'm just tapping the autofocus button again hitting it again getting my fingers off of it because what will happen just like always and you've seen it if you've got the r7 or some of the other cameras if you're holding that autofocus button down the whole time and taking your pictures you'll see that it will go from the small box in the eye to the whole body on the bird and sometimes the tail or sometimes it'll hit the branch so when it does that again, what well, we're back to that we talked about before, now you've got sensor speed, processor, motor signals going back and forth saying, here, where am I supposed to be focusing? When it jumps to that branch, now you may have moved the tail or the head of that bird outside the focal plane. So the whole thing of this is tap that single point button, get it close to the focus. When you get lock on that bird or the moose, the fox or whatever you're shooting, and he's not moving outside of the focal plane you have set, get your finger off the button. If you don't, it's going to move around. The R5, it, a lot of people go, R5 didn't do it. Yes, the R5 does do it. The readout sensor on that 5 is faster, so you're having quicker communications from the sensor to the processor to the motors. They have twice as fast signal moving through there to say move here quicker, and you're shooting less frames. So shooting more frames, have a slower sensor, you're going to see that focus shift drift inside there. So that's my best advice. I don't have any problems by using that. I have no problems with autofocus uh, other than when I screw up by not giving the camera enough contrast in the image to find the bird of the eye. Like I said, with those sandpipers or the grill legs and that reflective surface, which really made me bad when I got home because I didn't look at the images. Uh, my focus wasn't quite right because I screwed up by the limitations of the camera. So that's another thing you need to know about your camera. Know your camera and know the technical limitations of your camera. I don't use the R7 like I do the R5. I don't do the R5 and the R7 like I do with the Z8 and Z9 and the other cameras I have. And that is because they have different technical limitations. I know with the Z8 Z9 what I need to do with different types of contrasts and colors and white balances, all those other things. So I know with these cannons what I need to do with those. So learn those things and you won't have any problems with that autofocus. Like I have no problems. I called Don, my uncle, who shoots only the R7 and he shoots the 100-400 RF great lens. I'm probably going to do another review on that because that is just a fantastic budget combo where you can get that thing under $2,500 for a full wildlife rig. And I said, do you have any problems? Do you have any suggestions or whatever with your R7 uh, when I do this video? And he says, no. He says, yeah, I have no problem with autofocus. I, everything works great. My images look great. And he's shooting some kind of fast birds and he can't get as close to the birds and subjects as I do. So, he's had no problem either so the autofocus on this guy is great now at the end of this we'll go through the pros and the cons of this camera what i think is really good and what is really bad but that is my complete thoughts on this autofocus how to use it in my opinion i'll probably do another video about how to use the autofocus in the field which button to hit in different situations and single point all that stuff later but this was a little bit of a long conversation but i kind of wanted to get my thoughts out on this camera and other people like Dwight Patton, people like that, that talk, contacted Canon to find out about that when they said the 15 frames per second and some other folks. That was really good because that really solidified what I knew about this camera by that those statements from Canon of actually what it was. So that's what it is. The autofocus is great on this. You don't think it's not. So let's go back out in the field. Let's shoot some more. We'll talk more about uh, using the camera. And then at the end, we'll talk about the pros and cons of this camera. And again, that first question we had at the beginning of the day is, is this still a good camera in 2023 going to 2024? Uh, and actually, how good is it, especially for the price? And so.
My moose is up, so I gotta go take pictures of him now. So he is up and walking around. Let's see if he can see. There he be. So we're gonna go play with this guy some more. So I'll talk to you in a bit. All right, well, I've come to here by a place that has a lot of mallards. And the reason I'm coming here is because we've been getting in the 20s for the last week or two, and all of my ponds are frozen over. So most of the ducks and stuff, I had the crested grebes and buffaloheads, stuff like that, they're gone. So now I'm, what's left is this little bit area where this creek comes, keeps this water open all year round. It's actually where I find my river otters. But anyway, we're talking about the R7 and the autofocus and we're talking about ducks and this thing just locks them up. It'll hit an eye. It'll hit eye quick. And the video again is tracking these things really nice. And there is a ton of mallards here and they are just playing and flopping and all kinds of fun stuff out here. And it's a little tricky for me to show you the cannon with what's going on through the camera because when I put the Atomos on top of it then I can't see through the viewfinder or the back screen. I only see the Atomos so it's kind of like trying to take long distance pictures with your phone. It just, it's really hard to do. You get really used to pulling up your eye. But for birds just the one thing about the Canon system is it just instantly locks up a head. It just hits it has no problem if I can find my duck, that is. One swimming here, lifting his head up, there he is. Problem is, now he's amongst other ducks. But, uh, okay, I'm gonna give you one little situation by the well, I tell you this autofocus is fantastic. So, I have a duck right here. And you can see I'm kind of more in focus with this branch a little bit, but this is out of focus where this duck is. And he is literally right behind a branch. So when I hit this autofocus button, if his eye pops up, it should grab his eye. Right now his head's kind of behind that log, so if I hit the focus right now, it doesn't go anywhere. But if he'll lift his head, so if I hit that autofocus, it's trying. There it goes, grab the top of his head. So the, the autofocus on this thing is just fantastic, finding ducks and birds behind things. So, just fantastic on the autofocus on this camera. Uh, that's the one thing with the Canads that I've really liked uh, since day one with the R7. The R5 was always good, but the R7 and the R8, even better. Just just fantastic at locking things up. And these ducks are at distance, too. It finds this mallard way out there. Did, did. Look at that, right on the head. Just fantastic right on the head again just fantastic and that's it getting to that stupid distance that i talk about you know that's that's stupid distance duck's not very big in the screen but uh and it's right there against that busy background too which is really cool Sorry. hey been good. just mallards everything else is froze up so <laughs>
let's get to the wrap up of this video. Getting out there and shooting those ducks was pretty cool. The light was really neat out there. Actually, the light is gone now. As you can see behind me, it's just gray, gray, gray skies. Um, it is nice because I had just enough light hitting that uh, ice. There's a little bit of ice on the other side where those ducks were to get a kind of cool image of those mallards and stuff. But so let's get into the pros and cons of this camera. So we'll talk about the cons first. And the cons of this aren't that bad. So one of the things we're going to talk about is sensor speed. It affects two things. It affects the autofocus um, with the motors like we talked earlier. And it also affects what we call rolling shutter. So a slower sensor speed causes that. So what do you see by having a slower sensor speed? Well, we talked earlier about the autofocus. So as it's trying to read and send stuff to the motor from the processor back and forth, it gets kind of caught in between there when you're shooting 30 frames a second. Uh, if you drop that down to lower, you're going to see that less often because it's got more time between each shot to for this motor to move where it needs to tell for the process to tell the motor where to go on the lens. But at 30 frames a second, if you follow what I talked about before, where you stay off that autofocus button, because it's only going to be moving when the autofocus button is engaged when you're shooting stills. So if you get your focus, get off of it, take your shots, then you're okay. Now, if you're holding that down the whole time while taking them, yeah, you're going to have those problems. The second thing is rolling shutter. Now, there are times, extreme conditions, when you're shooting hummingbirds, something fast wings, you catch it between movements. Um, you will see weird wing tips and things like that. So rolling shutter will cause that when you have this slower shutter speed at 31 milliseconds. Uh, there was even fit pictures you've seen before where the bird's high in the frame and its reflection's low in the frame and their wing positions are different different shapes. So you got to be aware of that too, that that readout speed on something happening really fast could cause weird wing shapes and things like that. It'll also cause stretch or warping in the image. Now, when that happens, you can only tell if you have a comparable image to look at, one that doesn't have the warp or whatever, or the one that does. And that happens usually from having a rotational movement when you're taking the picture and with the with the shutter. So you're kind of rotating a little bit like that, so it causes a stretch or a bow. Um, so a steady hand helps. But Again, you really don't see those unless you um, have a comparable image to look at. Now, sometimes it does do a massive stretch, but that's very, very rare. So those don't stop you from taking images, but they are cons of the camera. The next con or problems I've had with, not really problems with the camera, but things that will happen with the camera is the eyepiece. We had a video a while back about replacing the eyepiece from the original manufacturer one. It took about a year for mine to tear up. My uncle's had his for about a year, and his hasn't tore up yet much, but uh, I get a little more rough on my equipment and stuff like that too. The other thing is they don't make a grip for this camera. I wish they made a grip for this camera. If they did, it would, especially with this big 500, it would feel better because what happens when you're holding this in your hand, it digs into the palm of your hand and you're holding it. But, um, but most people aren't running this big, you know, monster lens like I am. But if you do have a heavier lens that digs in, a bigger body would be, be a little better. Trying to think of any other con on this camera, and I can't. That's, that's really it. Uh, the biggest one is that readout speed. Um, when you're shooting 30 frames a second. And if you're holding the autofocus button down, that's the biggest one. And you'll get in the rolling shutter, those two things are, that's really it. Other than that, I don't have any other negatives. Now, let's get into the pros of this camera. So the pros of this camera is you're shooting 32 megapixels crop sensor. It's actually 80 something megapixel sensor with its full frame, which is huge. But at 32 megapixels, you have plenty of room to crop in on your image and reframe re your image if you need to recompose. Just incredible. The autofocus is fantastic. What I love about the autofocus on this camera, and when you go to the autofocus, how good they are, um, the R5 was good. The R7 is better because it more has a more advanced autofocus system in it. And then you get into the R8 and the R3 because the R8 has a little bit more advanced than the R7 does is autofocus. It just gets better and better and better. Um, when they added the horses in, that helped us for other animals, so they'll add some more, but it will even hit at long distances um, when you see a doll sheep small in the frame. It will still find it out on the mountain. 
it will find things amongst branches and stuff fairly well. Um, if it can see the head of the eye of an animal, it will grab it. Uh, I, I don't have, I have complete confidence in the autofocus with Canon. Uh, with, with this camera, the R7. I know if I hit it on something, a person, uh, an animal, a bird, it's going to grab it. It's going to grab it in distance, too. And that's what's incredible by grabbing it at distance. Um, so the autofocus on this thing is fantastic. The image quality that comes off this camera is fantastic. I, I didn't couldn't put anything on the cons on that. The colors are great. The the sharpness depends on the lens you got, of course. They're, they're great. The color edition is great. Everything looks good in it. On top of that, when you go to video, the video is fantastic. The auto tracking works really good. It grabs it really well, tracks it well throughout the frame, and, and that's what's fantastic. Because when you get to this autofocus we talked earlier, you can go frame to frame. I never do small boxes with my autofocus to hit it like I do with the other cameras. I just leave it corner to corner, and it finds what I'm looking for in there. And if it finds more than one, it gives you a little box, little arrows. You can say, okay, I don't want that one. I want this one, which is really, really cool. Uh, just, just fantastic. This camera, like all the R-Series cameras, adapts lenses extremely well. Uh, with this 500 Prime using the RF adapter on here, it works fantastic. Just about like the DSLRs work, work with it. Works really, really good. Um, I don't have any problems. This 500 f/4, my 770, uh, this 500 f/4, the 7200 Mark III work great. Those are my two workhorse lenses for this camera. I do have some of the wider lenses, the 50, the 35, the 1618. Those those lenses also, and of course even the 100 macro, the LEF 100 macro works great on this camera. It's really cool. So another positive to this is you're at a crop factor, your 1.6 crop factor, uh, which is fantastic. So with this 500 millimeter lens, your effective focal length is 800 millimeters, which is great to reach out there and fill the frame. Now, you gotta remember <clears throat> with extenders, crop factor, things like that, you're not wanting to try to shoot a farther distance because you get to farther distance, we've talked before, I need to do a whole video on this, is you start introducing atmospheric distortion and things like that is the farther away you get with just the heat dispersions, light, and all those kind of things. Um, you just want to make things bigger in the frame. But with a crop factor, what you got to remember is your depth of field with the crop factor. So even though you've got 800 millimeters effective focal length on this guy, your depth of field is still only 500 what the lens is. So you're expecting you know, you don't have 800 millimeters with the depth of field at f/4. You have 500 f/4. So what that means is, if your depth of field is, say, this far at 500 f/4, you on a crop factor, your depth of field is still that. It doesn't like at 800 at f/4, you'd expect it to start getting more shallow, but that's not what it does because it's still at the 500 length on your depth of field. So remember, on that, if you're shooting one to 600, which means you're about 900 on your uh, crop factor effective focal length. Your depth of field is still at 600 and whatever your aperture is. So remember that if you're doing calculations or looking at your depth of field. What that means is you need to make sure, be a little more careful with your background. So if you want the good bokeh and the drop off and the, that blur is to think about that more because of your depth of field on that. So the ergonomic button layout on this camera, the pros on it, kind of a pro positive and a negative I guess on this one if you're somebody that shoots multiple can and cameras the layout on this one's completely different I really still feel that this camera was an experimental camera for Canon one is because the menus and the features they put in this were different than the other can the R5 and the R6 the button layout was completely foreign and different pretty much for the most part on the dial with the joystick uh, the on off switch all those fun things was different on this camera it was really an experimental hey let's put it out there and see what sticks and for me i really like the layout especially i like the uh the dial by the joystick i like kind of having that because you have a couple things without moving your thumb so if you set that joystick up to push in to do something on top of your dial and then which direction the joystick's going you've got three things right there on your thumb right there um, and it's real close to the af on button everything right there so it's really nice the evf is great more than more than adequate to do whatever you're going to do the lcd is fantastic this guy touch screen everything 
the battery life the battery life on this thing because it uses the same batteries is fantastic on the r7 really good and that battery sends enough to this motor even with this big 504 it pushes this motor fine these bigger motors and the battery life is still great it'll still last me almost a full day of running around out and shooting in the wild so what's some of the other things that's kind of a pro con and a, and a positive either way it's the uh, the sd card slots in this thing this has a dual SD card slot type 2. It doesn't have a type B CF Express, uh, which would be nice because if you had that, this thing would probably run forever at 30 frames a second. But seeing that it has the type 2, your SD card speeds V30 to V90s. And what does that mean? Well, you hit that buffer really quick at 30 frames a second. So you'll get a couple second burst out of a V90 card. Now, shoot the v30s you can get probably 40 some shots at it before it's the buffer and how do we overcome that is we feather the shutter as we hit them so we don't just hold it down if you just hold it down you're going to run out quick it's going to hit just under two seconds again at v90 it's going to hit the wall done it's going to stop and you got to wait it's just busy you got to wait for it to take those out of the buffer and put them onto the card and that's why you do a v90 because it moves quicker off that buffer into the into the card so you can get back into the game again so what we do another reason to shoot the v90s is you want to feather that buffer you just want to do a small click rip rip you just kind of want to rip a few off at a time and kind of just lift that finger for just a quick you know time zip 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 and that's how we do it and then we don't hit the buffer on a v90 now if you're using a v30 you try that if you hold it down a little too long in between the little lift offs you're gonna hit that buffer you're stuck but on a v90 it's gonna clear pretty quick anchors in their airplanes i'll tell you they're just everywhere noisy so that's kind of why and then the next thing about the, the st cards is the v90 cards get kind of expensive they get up in that 150 200 range for 128 megabytes so they get pretty expensive so now what's the final consensus on this guy after using for a year and a half do i still think it's a great camera do i think it's still a good buy uh, from now going to 2024 with all the cameras that are out on the market now is it still great for beginners and you know intermediate and even uh, pros have it in their bag just as a, another body and my answers were resounding yes of course at fifteen hundred dollars for having a crop sensor at 30 frames a second has a phenomenal eye tracking great video incredible video for wildlife because you can shoot 1080p at 120 frames a second to get those nice buttery slow motions or you can shoot 4k up to 60 if you want for still slow-mo but not as buttery it does all those things having that crop factor to be able to reach out farther i had an ex example today that was really good i had my nikon sitting in the, the truck with the new 180 600 testing that lens feature video and i had this sitting here because this is what i'm running this weekend with this r7 and there's a white raven that's in town. Uh, just incredible, really cool to see. It's not uh, it's not an albino, it's that, uh, I don't care what, the, what you call it, lacustic or something like that when they have no pigment in their feathers, so they're white. And that's what this is. And I was driving back down the road and I happened to see it on the side of the road. And I just had to stop, pull over quick. So I got the Nikon sitting over there. I got this sitting over here. What do I grab? Because the bird's farther away. I grabbed this R7 because I want to fill the frame with that bird. It's a rare, more rare bird. So I grabbed the R7 with the 500, some 800 focal length, whip around there, grab that eye you know, on a bird that really shouldn't recognize, you know, White Raven. And it just grabbed it real quick. And But this is the camera I grabbed because I had them both sitting right there in the passenger seat. And this is the one I got because this was had the better reach and all that stuff. So yes, for beginners, fantastic because this guy sits at fifteen hundred dollars you can pair it with the rf 100 to 400 lens which is about six hundred or so dollars maybe seven hundred dollars uh goes on sale from time to time which means you can be you know under twenty five hundred dollars and have a prof great rig almost professional rig um for the intermediate shooters hobbyist uh pro hobbyists whatever you want to call them yes and again great because you've got a lot of reach on that and you've got that fast range per second and then for pros yes it's just another tool cameras are tools for the pros so by having a good crop sensor camera that's fast effective and not real expensive so again for those guys if they tear up the camera they can go buy another one hopefully if they've got money but 
yeah it fits in all those niches it, it's just it's a great wildlife camera it's just fantastic uh with that like i said that auto focus and the colors and everything it's just just fantastic um that's why i still have it and just it, it stays in the truck it stays attached to a lens it's ready to go at all times another reason why i think it's great is when don was asking he's going to get back into photography especially wildlife photography the R7 is what I suggested to him in that RF 100-400 rig to, to be, you know, a cost-effective rig, but a fantastic rig. And I called and asked him before I did this video, I said, hey, you're shooting this all the time. Is there any negatives or positives or anything, any any issues you have with the camera, anything you had to overcome or anything like that? And his answer was resounding, no, the camera's fantastic. You don't really have any problems with it. So I found that a good testament because he shoots all the time he loves doing it and he's always out shooting something and he's shooting hummingbirds he's shooting uh uh scissor tail fly catchers things like that that move erratic and he's had some fantastic shots of it uh, he had a hummingbird shot that i just think was incredible now yes great camera i still stand behind his camera i think if you're looking to get into wildlife photography and especially if you got a budget this guy's great and the R7 is fantastic, especially if you're doing small birds. Things incredible. But, yeah, that's about it. As always, guys, at the end of the video, like, subscribe, share, all those fun things. Think about becoming a member if you want to help us out do more of these videos. And, again, when we hit 10,000 subscribers, I've got a couple giveaways. Plus, you know, we'll probably do a few more prints than just one. But I have definitely have two giveaways you're really like. So, uh, make sure you stay tuned to the channel for that and hopefully we hit 10k before we hit December because it'd be nice to have it out as a Christmas gift plus the 10k subscribers. But anyway, until next time guys, get outside and go run that shutter.